Hey guys, uh, welcome to the channel again. Uh, it's been a little bit of a, a gap between my last upload, um, and I've been living in um, my in-law's house, looking for a house, and we finally found one. So that's what you see here in the background is our new uh, new house. Might give a house tour if you guys want. Um, but wanted to get into um, just reacting to different uh, engineering things. I am a mechanical engineer myself. Um, I'm almost out. I graduated in 2021. I currently have a job at a defense company and uh, I just really like what I do and uh, just a lot of interesting things about you know everything that's been made and so uh, just thought I'd uh, review it and maybe people want to tag along and uh, check it out too so um, yeah so we're gonna start this series I'm gonna try to do like one a week maybe on different ones you guys have different things you want me to uh, watch and stuff uh, definitely leave it in the comments leave a link for it um, and we'll watch it. So uh, let's get started. I have disclaimer. I have watched this before, but it's been a hot minute. I don't even remember it, it at all. So there's that. So this will be pretty much, a, you know, straight from the straight it's from the top reaction. So um, yeah, going on the SR71 Blackbird, like one of the coolest designs ever made. Um, coolest planes ever. I'm big into aviation. Uh, I have my own, I have my pilot's license myself. I got that uh, in 2017, just out of high school. Um, so I can probably put some pictures on the screen. Um, but uh, yeah, I really like flying and uh, as an engineer, you know, all the mechanics that go into everything, it's just kind of blows your mind, you know, uh, especially that long ago, being able to do the design work that they did. So yeah, let's just uh, go through this thing and see what happens. It's hard to explain the engineering marvel that is the SR-71 Blackbird, a long-range plane capable of flying 26 kilometers above the surface of the planet, so high that the pilots could see the curvature of the planet and the inky black of space from their cockpits. It 26 kilometers, let's see what that is. 26 kilometers, I actually don't know two feet I guess that'll work 85,000 feet wow look at that and to miles they have miles on here oh they have nautical oh there's mile 16 miles that's crazy and we're flying at about 38,000 feet or so on uh, southwest it flew so fast that the engineers had to develop entirely new materials and designs to mitigate and dissipate the heat generated from aerodynamic friction. Entirely unique engines were needed to function from zero all the way up to Mach 3.2, dealing with the myriad of problems like cooling, fuel efficiency, and supersonic shockwaves interfering with airflow. A plane so advanced that when it detected a surface-to-air missile, its response was simply to change course and speed up. Hmm. Even though the missiles had a higher top speed, they couldn't achieve the range and high altitude maneuverability the Blackbird could. This allowed the SR-71 to run hundreds of missions through Vietnam, North Korea and Iraq without ever losing an aircraft to enemy fire, despite multiple attempts. The entire plane was built around the propulsion system, which alone was a miracle of engineering design. For one, no turbine-driven jet engine can operate with supersonic flow at its inlet. Yet, this plane was powered by the Pratt & Whitney J58 turbojet engine. But get this, off the shelf, these engines could only provide 17.6% of the thrust required for Mach 3.2 flight, a speed which the SR-71 could cruise at for extended periods of time. How on earth did it manage that? In order to achieve those kinds of speeds, a ramjet is typically needed. A ramjet, as you can probably guess from the name, relies on ram pressure to operate. Ram pressure is simply the pressure that occurs. I think I remember this. I think uh, the the nose cone of it, and I think they showed it in the beginning, uh, actually moves in and out, and uh, has to do with something with the aerodynamics. I'm sure I'll explain it here again, but I just think that's really cool how they design that in there rams itself through the air so as the engine moves through the sky it funnels this high pressure air inside 
before entering the combustion chamber, the supersonic airflow must be first slowed down. This basically acts like the compressor stage of a normal jet engine, elevating the air pressure before it enters the combustion chamber. And that all goes off of Bernoulli's principle, right? Um, you know, you, you see the classic, I'll bring it up, Bernoulli. Um, you know, that's how planes fly. Bernoulli, I'm going to butcher the spelling. Ooh, did I get it right? No, I was close. So, yeah, that's the classic, um, classic diagram here where you have, um, you know, a bigger diameter uh, with lower pressure. No, with higher pressure, and then you go to a, a decreased um, higher velocity flow, which is a lower pressure. And so that's why you get um, on your wing, you have uh, the top of it is arced, and you get the air has to travel that arc, which is longer than a straight line. So the air it has a lower pressure on the bottom, on the top of the wing, and the high pressure on the bottom of the wing, and that's how you achieve lift. I did, I wish I could find it. I'll have to try to find it sometime. Maybe I can edit it in the video, but I did in, um, um, in our ANSYS class, which is a simulation for CFD uh, in college. I did a ground effect on a wing. And so ground effect, basically you have uh, wingtip vortices that are formed. So basically what happens with that is the um, air over the top of the wing is uh, lower pressure and the air on the bottom wing is high pressure and at the uh, end of the wing it spills over and so you see like um, a corkscrew of air. Um, I'll see if I can find a picture of that. Um, wingtip vortices, that's what it would be. Really cool. But when you go into ground effect, um, those don't happen. Let's see if there's a good picture of it here on Google. Um, yeah, here's a good, here's a good, uh, visual of it. This actually was probably the one I used in my presentation. Now that I think of it. Yeah. So that's why they have the winglets on these, uh, aircraft because, or on the, like the airliners, excuse me, because you can see that the air or the tip is smaller. Therefore there's a smaller vortice, less drag because it actually creates drag. But when you're in ground effect, um, the vortice can't spill off the end. It just kind of hits the runway or ground. And uh, it doesn't allow that high pressure air to spill out over the, uh, over the edge of the wing. So you get increased lift and ground effect. Um, so anyhow, long explanation, but it's pretty cool. My results showed anywhere from like, um, I think it was a five to 10% increase in lift and then a decreased drag as well. So I'll see if I can find that. It's pretty cool. Once the air enters the combustion chamber, it is mixed with fuel and ignited. It expands and accelerates once again out of the exit nozzle. With no moving parts, this type of engine is capable of flying at speeds far greater than a typical turbine driven engine, but it cannot oh, the B start from zero. I actually saw one of those this summer in, in person. It's so cool. Such a huge air airplane. I'll throw some pictures chamber. here on screen too. So they are either dropped from a conventional plane have a secondary propulsion system or are a hybrid of a conventional jet engine and a ramjet, which is precisely what the SR-71 used. The turbojet J58 engine of the SR-71 is nestled inside the nacelle here. In front and around the J58 is a complicated system of airflow management. These control mechanisms allow the propulsion system to transition from a primarily turbojet engine to a ramjet engine in mid-flight. First, the inlet spike. It is capable of moving forward and back by 0 yep, 0.66 I do remember meters. This. this adjusts the inlet and throat area, which controls the airflow entering the engine. It also keeps the position of the normal shockwave at its ideal position between the inlet Literally throat using and the principle. compressor. This is the most efficient position for the shockwave as it minimizes the energy lost due to drag as air flows over the shockwave. The inlet spike stays in the forward position until Mach 1.6. After this point, it begins to move backwards by 41 millimeters for every 0.1 increase in Mach number, keeping the shockwave in its ideal position. The inlet spike contains perforations which connect to the outside of the nacelle through ducts. Initially, the airflow will come from the outside in to provide additional airflow to the turbojet engines. But once the plane hits about Mach 0 
this airflow reverses. As the plane speeds up, the inlet spike develops a significant boundary layer of air. A boundary layer is a layer of very slow moving air that clings to the surface of objects. By bleeding this layer of slow moving air off the inlet spike, it frees up a greater area of the inlet area for high energy, fast moving air and thus improves efficiency. Around the engine, there is a bypass area. Yeah, that boundary layer, uh, what you just talked about there, that's important just not only in air, but in fluids as well. Uh, in fluid, fluid dynamics, yeah, fluid mechanics, um, we did labs and stuff, but even in a pipe, you'll see that, um, you see the, the faster moving arrows, I think it was maybe back here. Yeah, the arrows here. Um, while uh, you have the slower ones on bottom and the faster on top. Um, so that kind of, you know, that's just that theoretically right, you know, right at that instance of where air is meeting that surface, it's not moving. And then it's kind of an exponential, you know, um, profile there. Uh, but that's important in uh, heat transfer as well for like fluids, like water cooling or even, you know, heat exchangers you get that boundary layer effect and to get more cooling uh cool people do this in uh manufacturers do this in their um, water cooling kits for pcs um, basically you want that water to be turbulent and not laminar um, and so um, the turbulent water or fluid cooling fluid uh, basically cools better because there's not that boundary layer so there's you know a layer basically insulating it um, itself so you can break that up and then get more more uh cooler water to it and not have that warmer boundary layer so but pretty cool it can be applied to many things area of the inlet area for high energy fast moving air and thus improves efficiency around the engine there is a bypass area which takes air from the inlet and bypasses it around the j58 engine this air was used to cool the j58 which again improved engine efficiency and allowed the plane to fly faster. After the air passes the engine, it re Okay, yeah, so the cooling would help it, uh, the performance, because you have, um, if you think about a cool mass of air, uh, it's gonna be denser. And then if you're heating it, you know, if you start at 50 C and go up to 1000 C, um, you know, that's gonna expand X amount. And so, if you have something that's at a couple hundred C degrees Celsius and goes to a thousand, it's not going to expand as much. So you're going to have less of a bang or a less of a, an explosion. Um, so less thrust. So makes sense um, why that uh, increases performance. Rejoins the airflow just after the engine after burner, adding additional thrust as more oxygen becomes available for combustion and increases the pressure through the ejector nozzle. Yeah, and this is also true in like just regular combustion en combustion engines and cars. That's why they have cold air intakes. So you have a uh, greater differential in your uh, uh, um, temperature in your combustion chamber. Air got into this bypass area in a number of ways. There was a shock trap, otherwise known as the cowl bleed, located here, which again helped minimize boundary layer growth. There were suck-in doors located here, which only opened from Mach 0 to Mach 0 0.5 to add additional air to the bypass for engine cooling. Air from the aft bypass doors located just before the J58 engine also fed into the bypass. The I'm actually going to turn my fan on one second. Got the sun shining in on here and my 3D printer has been going for a while so the room's a little toasty. These together with the forward bypass Even doors have the window which open. vented to the atmosphere were used to control the pressure level in the inlet at the optimum level. If it was getting too high, a pressure sensor would trigger the forward bypass doors to open, allowing more air to exit the inlet, while the aft bypass doors were controlled by the pilot. These doors played a critical role in maintaining the position of the normal shock wave. If this was mismanaged, the engine would lose control of the normal shockwave and may even spit it out of the intake, resulting in a sudden power loss called an unstart, which would cause the plane to violently yaw. Okay, I 
think I now understand more fully what's going on here. The engine here. would lose control of the normal shockwave and may even spit it out of the intake. Resul yeah, so that's why the cone moves, is to move the hypotenuse of the uh, shockwave so that it will make it into that inlet and cram more air in the engine, basically, I think is how I'm understanding that. So if the nose is too far out, Shockwaves are kind of interesting. I don't, I'm not, I don't know a ton about them. I've seen stuff in like Schlieren imaging and stuff where you can, you can see it in a mirror and stuff, but hmm, that's interesting, but it makes sense. Resulting in a sudden power loss called an unstart, which would cause the plane to violently yaw in the direction of the faulty engine. If this happened, the forward bypass doors would open fully and the spike would move to the forward position to reduce back pressure and get the shockwave back into its normal position. Besides this bypass area that took air from the inlet and dumped it into the ejector, there were also six bypass ducts that took air from the compressor and dumped it directly into the afterburner. These ducts were the primary mechanism that transformed the engine from a turbojet into a ramjet. Afterburners are great. They significantly add to thrust without needing a whole lot of additional weight. And they sound and look um, just freaking awesome. I saw a twenty uh, F twenty or uh, yeah a Raptor F twenty two Raptor go by at an air show one time. And I was like, oh, it's just the, the greatest. Like you can feel the shock wave and the sound go through your body, and just listening to that, and then just poop went straight up and disappeared. It's like man, that'd be so fun to drive, fly. They basically just inject fuel into the exhaust of the jet engine and ignite it with whatever oxygen is left to provide additional expansion and therefore thrust, but they are really inefficient. However, as the speed increases, they are the only feasible way to generate thrust and they do gain efficiency thanks to the forward motion providing the compression of air needed to run them, instead of the turbine needing to be powered to turn the compressor stage. The crazy thing about the SR-71 is that the engineers could have eked out more thrust from this engine to increase the top speed even more. Ramjets can go up to Mach 5, so why did they stop at 3.2? Would they have run out of fuel? Fuel efficiency in terms of cost doesn't mean a whole lot to a military plane like this. Mm. The military doesn't care about cost, <laughs> but the That's more fuel sure. you carry, the heavier and bigger the plane gets increasing the fuel it uses. There is a break-even point and the plane's range will be limited, but the engineers did manage to fill the plane up with an astounding amount of fuel with some clever engineering. This is always something I've wondered. I always look at these planes and I'm like, where the, where the heck does all the fuel go? So, uh, yeah, this will be interesting. The plane was strictly a surveillance plane, so no internal volume was used for weapons, freeing up space for fuel. You have probably heard that the SR-71 leaks fuel on the runway because there were gaps in the fuselage, but that's a simple fact that ignores much of the engineering that caused it. The SR-71 used something called a total wet wing fuel tank system, which meant that the fuel was not contained within a separate fuel bladder. This was a weight saving measure. Separate metal fuel tanks would add too much weight and lighter plastic ones would melt from the intense heat generated from the aerodynamic friction. So the fuel was contained by the skin of the plane itself. The engineers applied sealant to every gap the fuel could possibly come out of, but because the titanium skin of the plane expanded and contracted with every flight, it gradually deteriorated over mm. time. It's basically, it's a flying pop can <laughs> with wings on it. Uh, <laughs> Well, you got to do what you got to do. You got to make, sac you know, there's a, there's always something that you have to trade in order to get something else. And never a free lunch is what my uh, teacher in high school you also always used to tell me. So, man, that's interesting. I, I didn't, I didn't know I had no dedicated fuel tank. That's interesting. Allowing the fuel to leak out. Because of this, the SR-71 had to regularly go into maintenance. Yeah, so that whole area behind the cockpit i'm assuming it kind of cuts off here they could just fill that whole thing with fuel it's just like yeah literally a flying pop can wow and have sealant reapplied but it usually came back still leaking just not quite as much 
The number of man hours required to reduce it to zero was simply too great to fit it between flights. So they just had an allowable fuel leak limit, which looked like this. This plane, like a rocket, was can't fix it, slap a limit on it. There we go. It happens. Was mostly fuel. Its dry weight, depending on sensor payload, was between 25 and 27 tons. Its wet weight was between 61 and 63 tons, making it, by weight, 59% fuel to feed those hungry engines. Looks like that red area might have been where the fuel tanks were. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that makes sense because you kind of have your main uh, stress member, it looks like, there maybe at the end too. Here and here, that kind of holds everything together. Yeah. Huh. By weight, 59% fuel <clears throat> to feed those hungry engines. Even then, without the ability to refuel in the air, this plane would have had terrible range for what was supposed to be a long range spy plane. Range varied greatly. For example, the engines became significantly less efficient when the outside temperature was higher. A fully loaded SR-71 could expect to burn nearly 13 metric tons of fuel accelerating from Mach 1.25 at 30,000 feet to Mach 3 at 70,000 feet if the outside temperature was 10 degrees Celsius above standard. That is 36% of its fuel capacity. If it was 10 degrees wow. below standard, the fuel burn nearly halved to 7.2 tons. Just shows you the difference between, and that's why we do cold air intakes on cars, the difference between how much more power you get and efficiency and just air density and temperature. Your delta T is crazy. Man. But, you know, they pulled off the classic, don't fill it with a ton of fuel to get it off the ground because jet engines suck at low altitude because the air is so thick and dense. And then you fill it up when you're in air and, you know, you can really load it down so you don't you don't have to take off a tank basically and burn all your fuel it's just a much more efficient way to do things and of course the range was severely affected by their speed and use of the afterburner but yep. on average the sr-71 had a range of about 5200 kilometers about enough for a one-way trip from new york to london not terribly useful the us was not going to be landing at their target to hand over a top secret plane to the enemy. Yeah. However, with aerial refueling, the plane could stay in the air more or less indefinitely, provided there was no mechanical issues. Really, the range was entirely right. determined by the pilots. The longest operational sortie occurred in 1987, when the US flew the SR-71 from Okinawa to observe developments in the Iran-Iraq war. This mission lasted 11.2 hours, and likely required at least five aerial refuelings along the way. Holy cow. So if Okinawa to Iran. Okinawa. Wow. Uh, zoom out. Okinawa <laughs> directions <laughs> to Iran. macaroni so basically I had to fly over all of Asia in 11 hours but you're going Mach 3 so yeah that's that's not bad if it wasn't the fuel or engines that limited the SR-71's top speed what did at Mach 3.2 the nose of the SR-71 reached 300 degrees Celsius while the engine nacelles that's the max temperature of my hot end on my 3d printer could reach 306 at the front and 649 at the back. This is what truly limited the top speed of the SR-71. Without careful material selection and design, the plane would simply overheat and fail. Even the fuel needed to be specially formulated to get around these overheating issues. It was a specially formulated... Probably for detonation, I assume? Regarding the temperature expansion things, um, in my tool changer video, in my tool changer videos, my senior project that I did, my uh, x-axis is actually a machine piece of aluminum, 
and I plan to uh, 3D print um, peak, Altem, uh, materials like that, and it requires an uh, enclosure temperature of about 90 Celsius, plus you have the 120C heated bed, you know, putting some radiant um, heat into it. So it might get up to around 100C. So I had to calculate. I think it only moved like a couple thousandths of an inch of expansion over the length of the bar, but it's something I had to calculate and look at. So it's it's not actually a terribly hard calculation to do. So, but it's crazy how metal moves. Even like welding, I've done a lot of welding at previous internships and jobs, and um, you know you just apply heat to something and it turns into a banana. It's you know it's pretty crazy, especially aluminum. Aluminum's such a pain in the butt to weld. Of course, I didn't have much experience with it, so whoever welds aluminum probably thinks I'm, you know, dumb. But I don't have that much experience with it. Steel is much more forgiving. So, but anyhow, thermal expansion. Fuel called JP7, which has very low volatility and a high flash point. This was partially needed because the fuel leaked on the runway, and they needed a fuel that wouldn't ignite or easily evaporate and make the ground crew ill. But mostly, they needed a fuel that That's wouldn't fair. vaporize in the tanks and cause fuel feed and pressurization problems. Oh yeah, so if the skin, okay, so if the skin of the plane gets warm, it's going to heat up your tank, and it's basically like boiling water, you're turning it into vapor, and then it doesn't burn, or you get vapor lock in your airlines, you know. Same thing can happen to, actually I have a funny story about this, uh, not so funny, but my wife's 67 Camaro, uh, you know, old school car, carburetor, yada, yada, yada. Uh, we had been running um, just regular, you know, 87, but E80, I think it's up to 10% ethanol now in America at least. Um, and we were driving one night, and I guess the motor just, we maybe drove it around. We didn't really drive super fast, so we didn't get the engine cooled off, but basically the motor, it stalled out on us twice, and we had to let it sit for like an hour before it actually started again because long story short the motor warmed up which warmed up the carburetor which when the fuel was transported up there heated up the fuel and then evaporated the ethanol so then you get vapor lock in your carburetor and you don't get any you just get air in your your line to your motor and then your engine just stalls and it won't start so that's kind of what they were trying to avoid here so it's not a fun time i had to push it everywhere everybody was helpful jumping out of the cars in the middle of traffic to push off, you know, the Camaro, but yeah, it was not ideal. The JP7 fuel was so stable that it actually doubled as a coolant for the entire plane. The fuel was there pumped around the airframe to cool critical components like the engine oil, hydraulic systems, and control electronics. When the Killing two birds with one stone, the uh, rockets do that, like SpaceX, NASA, whatever, you know, they're, they're rocket cone that's probably a better term for the bell uh, anyhow um i should know i watch like all the spacex stuff um they use the i think the liquid oxygen or the mixture of it to cool the actual metal there's little veins in it and they use that to cool it while you know the rocket's coming out of it so kill two birds with one stone optimization fuel got too hot it was simply sent to the engines for combustion. The fuel was so stable that the plane actually oh, needed cool. to carry shots of triethyl borate, a fuel that spontaneously ignites in the presence of oxygen to start the combustion cycle and after burners. The plane usually only carried about 16 shots of this, so the pilots needed to manage them carefully, particularly when slowing down for refueling and managing unstarts. One huge question I had about the SR-71 was why it was painted black. Airliners are all white to reflect heat and prevent the plane from overheating. If that applies to an airliner, why not the SR-71? The SR-71's predecessors were unpainted, which saved weight, and the areas exposed to highest temperatures were painted black. Why was this? Surely black would absorb more heat. The Concorde was once painted blue for a Pepsi ad campaign, and had to lower its speed as it absorbed too much heat from the sun. However, the Concorde did not fly nearly as high or as fast as the SR-71, and as the SR-71 rose, the energy it absorbed from the sun dwindled in comparison to the heat it gained from aerodynamic friction. For this, 
we have to refer to something called Kirchhoff's Rule of Radiation, which tells us that a good heat absorber, like a black object, is also an equally effective heat emitter. So the black paint helped the SR-71 radiate heat away from the plane, as it allowed the plane to radiate more heat than it gained from the radiation from the sun. These efforts helped to keep the plane cool, but the structure of the plane still needed to be incredibly heat stable. Aluminium is typically the material aircraft engineers turn to. Yeah, you don't want to use that on this. <laughs> It'll melt and wilt so fast. But yeah, they're right what they said about the the black color being the perfect emissive. I'm not saying it right. Emissive it has a you know one in emissivity. Um, but it's a perfect absorber and white's a perfect reflector. So that makes sense to me about the black. I initially thought they would want it to be white. Cause then again, you have the, the air at their, where they're flying is like negative, I don't know, 70 Celsius. So you're already getting a cooling effect from the air, but you're also getting a heating effect from the friction, I guess. And they kind of stated it too, that at a certain point, the friction's the primary heater rather than the sun. So, yeah, interesting. It was used for the Concorde, but as we saw, it too had its speed limited by heat to a much lower Mach 2. Aluminium is cheap, has a great strength to rate ratio, and is easily machinable. Titanium, the material that made up 93% of the SR-71, has only one of these properties. Its strength to weight ratio otherwise known as specific strength, is fantastic. But titanium is incredibly expensive, despite it being the seventh most common metal. What kind of vehicle is that? Looks like one of those things that Kanye rode in with a bumper on it. In Earth's crust, the refinement process is incredibly long and requires expensive consumables. It's also not easily machinable, as it readily reacts with air when welding or forging becoming brittle. For these reasons, titanium is rarely used in structural parts in aviation. However, the real benefit of titanium is its ability to resist heat. The reasons for this are complex that we will explore in depth in future. However, the gist is that titanium alloys have incredibly strong bonding within its crystal lattice that resist heat from breaking them apart. Titanium alloys can resist temperatures up to 600 degrees Celsius before their atoms begin to diffuse and slide over each other significantly, allowing hmm. it to retain much of its strength even at 300 degrees. Looks like a giant pizza oven for the plane. <laughs> Man, that must have sucked back a lot of energy to run that thing, whatever that is. It has also very low thermal expansion. So that expansion and contraction we mentioned mm. earlier Yeah, that's important with the tanks and everything is minimized, reducing the thermal stresses in the aircraft. But titanium has its limits, and for the SR-71, this was about 3.2 Mach. Today, engineers have made huge strides in material science. The SR-71 used heat-resistant composite materials as radar-absorbing wedges between the structural frame located in these locations. The manufacturing techniques needed to make composite materials as load-bearing structures did not yet exist, but that has changed. The SR-71 successor, the SR-72, which is now in development, will take advantage of new, high-performance composites, which will allow it to reach speeds up to... I didn't know the SR-72 was in development. That's cool. Interesting. <laughs> to Mach 6. Many of its wow. engine components will likely be 3D printed type. Yeah. Oh, I got some pictures I'll throw up on the screen of some 3D printed metal stuff I saw at the uh, Rapid TCT conference in uh, Detroit this past May. Uh, a lot of cool stuff on there. Let me see if I can find it on my phone real quick. I'll throw it up on the screen. All right, here we go. So here's one of them. I don't know. Oh, they're kind of focused. But the uh, fractal pyramid you're used to probably seeing on Thingiverse or whatever. Uh, there was also, a, I think this was a fuel injector uh, there. So that was 3D printed. I forget the companies. Um, but uh, here's a peak part. So this one is, they said, is $429 US dollars worth of filament. 
this is peak so at that is very difficult to print from an FDM perspective it takes you know heated build chamber high heated bed uh, hot um, high temperature hot end so like 400 celsius which i have all of those things i just haven't got them working completely yet on my printer at home and it's going to suck back a lot of powder power so um i gotta figure that out as well but yeah some cool stuff from uh the tct show titanium with cooling ducts printed right into the part its range also won't be determined by pilots as it will be an autonomous drone the insane okay, engineering that makes planes that makes like sense. this possible fascinates me, and I recently watched an excellent documentary on Curious. That is a stinking CNC. It's huge. It's crazy. Stuff gets that big. Just when you think you have the biggest thing, there's always something bigger. Curiosity stream that details the build process for the world's largest airliner, the A380, chronicling the massive sheet metal cutting machines that cut the aluminium skin, the vacuum molds that form it and the biggest oven in Britain that locks the shape in place. Yeah, the A380, that's another crazy, that might be the next video. That thing is, it's just massive. It's a shame that they're not producing anymore. I think that's as of a couple of years ago, but those things are just freaking massive planes. Like, how do they even fly? It's crazy. It's like a cruise ship. How does it float? But it's just displacement and physics. It all works. This is just one step in the process, and the documentary is nearly an hour long. This is just one of thousands of documentaries by award-winning filmmakers available on Curiosity Stream right now, and a subscription costs just $11.99 for an entire year. With that subscription, you will get free access to Nebula, the streaming oh, service looks like created it's by over me here. and my fellow YouTube creators. Here. Cool. Well, that was the engineer's reaction, mechanical engineer's reaction to uh, the engineering insane engineering of an sr-71 blackbird so i really enjoyed that it uh, looks like there's a couple others here on the side for maybe future videos the warthog those fly around over my house every now and then uh we have some of those here locally at our uh our airport but uh yeah i really enjoyed that just again it just makes you realize the craziness that goes into the you know the pioneering that went into this aircraft you know the same as like this the whole moon mission uh, just blows my mind that those guys did that back then with you know for basically no computers and it's just crazy so hope you enjoyed that as much as i did uh looking forward to doing more of these and uh let me know any videos you want me to look at down in the comments uh yeah thanks for stopping by see ya